Okay, we'll we'll just pray and then we'll get started. Okay, let's let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that your word says that um, Lord, we re, we are, you said, Lord, that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Father, we thank you for uh, your generosity, Lord, in giving your very best, Lord, for us. For the sake of us, for the sake of all these generations, God, we thank you for the life that we have in you. We thank you for the hope that we have in you. Lord, we thank you for the change destiny that we enjoy, Lord, today because of you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for what you did for us on the cross. We thank you for reversing, Lord, um, the effects of sin, the effects of every curse that was upon us, Lord. We thank you for changing that. And we thank you for your grace and for your mercy, Lord, which we now walk in um, by faith. We thank you for everything that we receive from your hands, God. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for your favor that surrounds us. And Lord, we thank you that, uh, Lord, even as we spend this time in your presence, that, that you're more than willing and able to just reveal yourself, reveal your heart to us. And uh, I pray that that will be imprinted on our hearts more than anything else, God. That, that will make a change, Lord, uh, in our thinking, in our, Lord, in our perception of you, God. I pray that that will just change, God. We thank you. We come at this time into your mighty hands. I just pray for each and every uh, student who signed up for the course. I pray that it will be a blessing as we discover, as we dig deeper into your word. And I pray that it will make a change in each one of our lives. We thank you. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so yeah, welcome back. So this course is uh, uh, called Financial Stewardship. So we are going to be talking a lot about money. We're going to be talking, uh, looking into what the Word of God talks about money and uh, uh, wealth and prosperity and so on. So in terms of evaluation, um, assessment, we'll have two quizzes, uh, one probably by end of February or beginning of March, and one by the end of uh, April or the third week of April, right? So that will be uh, the assessment. And, uh, and, and of course, you know, like you've seen the schedule, we'll have one hour uh, weekly, which will be on the Thursday of every week, uh, one hour only. So it's a, it's a, it's really a short course, and um, so we're going to be um, looking at. Uh, uh, first of all, we're going to be looking at uh, money, wealth, prosperity. You know, uh, God's perspective of it, and the second part of it is uh, stewardship. You know, how do we uh, um, steward it, right? Uh, well, you know, o oversee it, take care of it, use it in the right way possible. Okay. Um, so yeah, so as we get into the course, uh, material has been uploaded uh, in the classwork section. You may have seen it already. You can download it and follow through uh, as we go through the class. Okay. So before we, before I share the notes with you on screen. Um, just wanted to make a few opening comments to say that uh, you know this whole aspect of money, uh, this whole aspect of um, wealth and prosperity has really been tainted, you know, in the sense we all of us know that we need money. And all of us know that you know if you're working professionally that uh, you you want to, work towards earning well nobody work works towards uh, you know uh, progressively earning less and less of money everybody wants to you know do well work well earn well um etc but the thing is though for us as believers the church as believers as followers of the lord jesus um either because of maybe wrong models, wrong role models in ministry, or the abuse of money and wealth in ministry, or maybe because of, uh, you know, uh, greed and covetousness and worldliness, which has uh, probably crept into the best of believers, the best of, you know, 
ministries and so on. So we, because of, you know, the wrong role models or they're not so perfect role models, you know, we, we kind of uh, have a very fuzzy perception or not very unclear, you know, not very clear where we stand with regard to money. You know, for example, things like, uh, you know, this happened to me. Uh, this was in a church where I used to, you know, fellowship many years ago. And uh, a friend of mine and uh, both of us, we were talking after the service. We was, you know, after the service, we were standing inside the church sanctuary and then just talking. And uh, we got to talk about many things. And then we, we kind of were talking about uh, work. You know, both of us were working in different companies at that time. So just talking about work professionally, how we were doing. And, and suddenly, you know, I, I, he, uh, I remember he said, you know, let's, let's go outside the church and talk. You know, because we were talking about work, we were talking about appraisals, we were talking about, um, you know, uh, our salaries and uh, uh, what happened. Because so, and then he, he, he suddenly said, you know, let's let's go outside the church and talk, uh, because we we're talking about all these things. Um, you know, let's. It's not nice to talk inside the church, you know, as if to say that you know, money and work and everything should not be spoken of in the church building, but outside the church building. So, you know, uh, so it has been colored, right? Money has been the whole thing of well, prosperity. If you mention prosperity itself, you know, there's so much. Um, it raises up, you know, stirs up people, and say, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with it. But at the same time. You know, we struggle, right? Uh, as a believer, what should I do? Because there is a need for money. Uh, how should I rightfully use it? Right? There is a need because in ministry, you know that bills have to be paid, uh, people have to be fed, clothes have to be bought. You know, needs are, have to be met, and uh, for all that, there is the requirement of money. Uh, you know, any noble ministry, you know, any well-meaning, sincere ministry requires finances, right? For to to function day to day, to grow, to help others, there is a need for finances. So it's it's good for us to understand, you know, what does the Bible talk about money? What does the Bible talk about finances? Okay, maybe there is a businessman. You know, you are a businessman, and uh, you're a working professional, right? Maybe you're not into what is called so-called full-time ministry. Um, so, in that as well, you know, as you carry out the plan and purpose of God as a businessman, as a working professional, you know, what should your stand in regarding money be? You know, there's no point in earning a lot, feeling guilty that. Hey, I cannot serve. You know, we we come across verses like you can't serve God and Mammon, and then say feeling guilty about the fact that there is money coming in, and uh, you know, not knowing how to you know, rightfully handle uh, money or how to give the right place for money uh, in in a, in our life, right? So we're going to be looking at all that. So we're going to start by looking at. Um, you know, may, maybe asking some questions and um, not really answering those questions, but uh, in the course of, you know, as we go through the course, you know, those questions will be sufficiently answered and sure as we look into the Word of God. Okay. So I'm just going to share um, uh, the, uh, share my screen here with the notes and uh, yeah. Okay, so there we go. Okay, so uh, so the word prosperity. Okay, so the word prosperity, if you look in the dictionary, it, it talks about doing well, thriving. You know, when we say prosper, it involves wealth, right? Uh, but it it's not just wealth alone. It means to be successful, grow, be productive, thrive, right? So. Uh, a prosperous person uh, would also, you know, it, it would also mean emotionally being prosperous. There's having a well-being emotionally, all that. Right? So, 
So we're looking at, you know, why prosperity? Should a Christian desire prosperity? You know, you're calling yourself a follower of the Lord Jesus. Um, and is it okay to desire prosperity? To be prosperous? Right? To thrive in all realms relationally? You know, with regard to health, with regard to finances? Is it okay for a Christian to desire that, right? And what should be my right motivation? What should be my motive for prosperity? Okay, so these are some questions that uh, I'm sure, you know, as believers, as we uh, journey with the Lord, at some point or the other, you've asked, okay? Uh, we've asked ourselves that question or, and maybe we didn't really dwell too much on it, but we just moved on, okay? Um, so we're going to, in this course, we're going to be looking at that. Okay, uh, a little more in detail, right? So what are the right attitudes to have or mindset to have when it comes to wealth, when it comes to finances, when it comes to prosperity? Okay. So let's look at a few verses here. Okay, um, look, 30, I'm sorry, um, Psalm 35 and verse 27 says, let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. And let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Okay, God who has pleasure, the Lord, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. So the Lord's desire and pleasure, it means that the Lord delights in it. Delights in what? in the prosperity of his servant. Okay. So uh, the Lord uh, takes delight, which means um, you know, who has pleasure. It's a, it's a pleasurable thing. It's something that delights the heart of God when he sees the servant, his servant, prosper, do well. Okay. Um, so that's Psalm 35 and verse 27. Okay. So that's something that that should, you know, that should really, uh, for some, it can be a very, um, you know, a paradigm shift. What the Lord has pleasure, he delights in the prosperity of a servant, right? When a person does well, thrive well, uh, in all realms, again, um, I'm using the word prosperity to talk about not just finances, but not just money, but about you know a well-rounded thing, everything in life, right? Um, relations and everything put together, emotions, physically, health-wise. You know, who takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servant? Okay, let's look at uh, Deuteronomy eight and verse eighteen. Okay, so it says uh, Deuteronomy eight and verse eighteen, and you shall remember the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant with the which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Okay, you shall remember the Lord your God. So, um, what what does he do? He it is he who gives you power, who gives you the ability, who empowers you to do what to get wealth. And then that he may establish his covenant with his sword to your fathers as it is this day. Okay, so um, so this uh, the right attitude towards money, our right ha heart attitude towards money is that may the Lord be glor glorified. Let God in to that picture when it comes to wealth. Right? Many times we live very compartmented lives, right? Okay, when it comes to church, spiritual things, matters of faith, ministry, serving God, okay, that's fine. But when it comes to certain other things, you know, when it comes to decisions about uh, money, earning, saving, investing, you know, uh, we somehow feel that, okay, it's, it's a worldly thing. I don't think I should even pray about it. I don't think I should even allow God into, the, into that picture, right, into that. But we see here that it is He, it is God. Who takes pleasure in you doing well in life, right? And it is God 
who empowers us whether through skill whether through knowledge understanding whether through his favor with, with whatever right it is he who empowers us who gives us the power to get wealth so therefore my attitude is you know it should change to say okay god i'm not money finances everything i'm not going to be uh, let it be compartmentalized i'm not going to leave you out of it god but i want to include you in it right i'm just bringing you into it god because this actually belongs to you it is uh, so that you may be glorified now i don't understand how you are going to be glorified in all this uh, but god i'm going to let you in and let you in uh, in that picture i'm going to let you in when when it comes to matters of money and wealth god i'm going to let you in right so that he may be glorified okay the other thing that we see is that uh when it comes to wealth our attitude is that uh, okay let there be enough for the work of god's kingdom i think this is something that we uh, you know we we can readily understand or relate to okay um so when we look at exodus 25 um uh, the lord is giving instruction to moses to build a sanctuary and uh, uh, for him and that 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 they would be worshiped that they that he would meet with him that he would give instructions uh, for their journey and so on so the the lord gives very specific instructions and he says you know bring me an offering you know speak to the children of israel that they bring me an offering and uh, he says from everyone who gives it willingly with his heart you shall take my offering so he qualifies it okay um if people are giving for this particular work that the sanctuary be built uh, let them be giving willingly and let them give it um uh, with their heart giving willingly from their heart it's not just saying that they're doing it willingly we do i don't want to force them i don't want to twist their hands to give but let them give it willingly as a choice right they make a choice to give um so this is uh, with this heart you shall take my offering and this is the offering which you shall take and he lists down gold silver bronze purple you know uh, it it talks about fabric it talks about uh, uh, leather it is it talks about precious stones and verse 8 let them make me a sanctuary that i may dwell among them according to all that i show you um that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings just uh, so you shall make it okay so for the work of for the work of worship actually they're building a sanctuary to to worship him he's going to teach them certain things he's going to lay them lay down certain precepts how of how he wants them to relate to him and and this is what god says right when you look at malachi chapter 3 um again he says bring all the tithes into the storehouse now we're going to spend some time looking at tithes offerings arms right we're going to be looking at uh, that so uh, i'm sure you might have questions about that so we'll hold off till then right we're going to be looking into that okay so the lord says bring all the tides into the so house that they may be food in my house Now try me in this says the lord of hosts if i will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it and i will rebuke the devourer for your six so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground nor shall the wine fail to bear fruit for you in the field says the lord of hosts and all the nations shall call you will call you blessed for you will be a delightful land says the lord of hosts okay so the second thing is when it comes to finances okay to say that okay to give to the work of ministry to support the work of in whatever way maybe it's a person maybe it's a organization maybe it's the local church um to for the work of ministry for the work of uh, maybe worship you know, maybe for the work of the kingdom of god expansion of the kingdom of god to to bring to to make known um to the gospel uh, make known the gospel to the people right who do not know yet so so all that so to have that right perspective okay i can use this for this 
Okay. And this is what God desires as well. It's not that this man is or this woman is constantly asking or, you know, to give and so on. While we see that, you know, that's the reality. That's the, you know, uh, sometimes that's the abuse of it. But the fact is that God has instituted that this material wealth, finances, be used for his purposes. Okay. Um, so while I'm, you know, while I'm get, getting, while I'm earning, while I'm prospering, to say that, okay, God, you take pleasure in it. You're the one who empowers me to receive this. And God, you have instituted that this be used for your work or the work of your kingdom. Um, so this is something that is not man-made, that is not church-made, but this is this is instituted by God. I like to have that attitude about money. Okay, this this is something that uh, God desires. This is God's will. So I. I do this willingly. I do this joyfully. I do it from my heart, and there is no compulsion, right? So, which works both ways, you know. Just as an aside, uh, you know, as a minister of God, if I'm compelling people to give, if I'm forcing people, if I'm manipulating people to give, you know, that's not God's heart. That's not God's way, right? And many times we we make that mistake because. Hey, that's how everybody does it. That's how every ministry does it. You know. So, uh, but that's not God's heart. You know, we see in several scriptures, even when we are talking about giving and all that, when we when we study Second Corinthians chapter nine, we see that uh, God always says that hey, it should be given as a free will. You know, this is something that should be given as a free will. It's out of the desire of your heart. And uh, it is not something that you manipulate, you twist, and you force, you, you know, put shame and guilt and condemnation and, and and just, you know, take it out of people. No, that is not, not what it is. Right? So these are some attitudes to have in the, for us to correct and say, okay, God, when I look at you, when I look at your word, you know, forget all that's happening culturally in Christendom, Christianity, churchianity. When I look at your word, God, this is your heart. So I want to do it the right way. Right? Okay. Um, we'll stop for some questions a little later. Okay. Um, just for after maybe five, ten minutes. Okay. Then the other thing that we see is that that when it comes to money, that we may be able to give to those to those who are in need. Okay. Um, when it comes to, okay, we are prospering and thriving and flourishing. Okay. So uh, I earn this much so that I can give to one who does not have. Okay. So that is also another objective. Right. Uh, Ephesians 4 and verse 28 says, let him who steal, sorry, who stole, steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Okay. Um, uh, I'm sorry, there's a, that scripture I've not put down. Yeah, so, so let him he's, who stole steal no longer, but let him labor. So let him work. Okay, don't steal. That's the wrong motive. Uh, so here's the thing, you know, sometimes you might say, okay, um, okay, I, I want to do this, uh, but I want to give, uh, but, the, but, the, but the method is wrong, right? So he's, it says here, you know, the one who steals also gets money, right? But we're not giving out of that, out of that method. It says, let him who ste stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, rather let him labor. So doing something righteous, doing something... Um, you know, uh, with effort, putting in effort, it could be anything. But let him labor, working with his hands, what is good, that he may have something to him to give him who has need. Okay, Galatians six and verse ten. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially though to those who are of the household of faith. So, doing good, 
helping others um you know that is also uh, something that we do with money uh, matthew 25 verse 40 and the king will answer and say to them surely i say to you as much as you did to one of the least of these my brethren you did it to me okay so so these are these are some good attitude i'm sure there are many more we can you know we can study and uh, uh, we can talk about but these are some basic uh, good attitudes to have about money about material wealth right so um so three things we we looked at that that god may be glorified that we might have enough for god's kingdom for the work of his kingdom and also that we may have enough to help others who have need okay um so that's a, a good attitude these are some good attitudes to have what are the wrong attitudes when it comes to money okay um covetousness and greed okay so which means that covetousness hey i have some and i covet what the other person has right i want that also i want that to be mine greed i want more and more and more of this to be spent on you know selfishly for my plan and my purposes so that is greed okay, luke 12 and verse 15 and he said to them take heed so these are the words of the lord right take heed and beware of covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses so covetousness is like constantly comparing and desiring what you know what is there out there maybe it belongs to someone maybe it it is there i you know the heart desiring that and saying hey, i want it to be mine okay so here is the lord's warning you know one's life does not consist you know in the abundance of the things he he or she possesses you know it's it's that doesn't uh, that doesn't really it's it's not really a, a marker or a you know or a standard for a good life right one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses first timothy 6 and verse 9 but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition okay again a wrong desire you know because it's either greed or covetousness okay so it's a it's a wrong desire right and and because of which there is there is always easy access that temptation has in our lives okay we can really easily open the door for temptation and open the door and fall into a snare a snare means a trap it's like a trap for an animal right uh, in which an animal gets caught something that allures or pulls and draws an animal into the trap and then you know it's it's shut catches the animal right so those a desire if this is their overwhelming desire i want to have more i want to have more i want to have more of it then we are actually becoming vulnerable to temptation it could be any form of temptation something that in or uh, something that you know invites us to commit sin and also it becomes a snare it traps us so that we we fall into many foolish and harmful lusts desires um so it it just keeps growing and it it is foolish harmful um which results in destruction of a person's life right and the lives of the those those who are connected with us that's the sad part you know when it's a family when it's friends a family so uh so yeah, there's a warning which paul writes to timothy and he says you know this is what happens so we're going to look at a verse which comes later uh, in the same chapter chapter 6 and verse 17 which actually gives the balance right um so we're going to look at that okay um hebrews 13 verse 5 let your conduct be without covetousness be content with such things as you have for he himself has said i will never leave you nor forsake you so the writer of hebrews is saying be content um let your conduct your behavior the way you live your life let it be without covetousness you know without uh having this driving desire i want to more i need to have more i need to have more of that 
uh, be content. Okay, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So the thing is that you have the Lord Jesus as your possession, never forget that. You have the Lord Jesus as your inheritance, you know, never forget that. You have the source himself. You have the one who, who created all things. Uh, and he has said that he will never leave and he will never forsake. And, and we're going to see that he's the provider. He's the one who empowers us to get wealth. He is the one who delights in us prospering. So why should you have covetousness and greed? Right. So it's a it's a thin line, right? The Lord desires for you to thrive and prosper. The Lord takes pleasure in it. The Lord is the one who empowers you so that you get more in order to use it, you know, on your on your on yourself and for others and for the for his purposes. But let not your heart be trapped with greed and covetousness. Okay, it's a very fine line. Okay. Um Luke 16, verses 14 and 15. Now the Pharisees who were lovers of money also heard all these things and they derided him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Okay, so uh, so these are the words of the Lord Jesus. And, uh, and we see him um, giving this instruction in Luke chapter um, 16. Okay, so it could be uh, covetousness and greed. Now that's a wrong motive or a wrong attitude to have about money. Okay, so as believers, then you know we correct ourselves and say, okay, God, I know there is a need. I know that you're the one who, who prospers me, but at the same time, let my heart not be covetous or let me not be greedy uh, uh, when it comes to material things. Okay, when it comes to money. Okay, um, or sometimes it's competition. You know, the other person has it. I want to have that, and I want to have more than that. Okay, uh, my you know my family member, that person has has bought this, so therefore I need to, I need to do that too, and to show that you know I am better, uh, I am one step uh, ahead, right? So I have that also. I don't fall behind in anything. You know, sometimes that it is that no comparison and competition. So uh, James 3, verses 14 and 15, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but it is earthly, sensual, demonic. So he's talking about envy and self-seeking. Envy, jealousy, comparing uh, us with others, and self-seeking, okay, being selfish. Now, don't have that. If you have that, you will end up boasting and lying against the truth. Okay, and it is it is something that is earthly, something of the flesh, something that is sensual and and demonic even. Right? Psalm seventy three three. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So the psalmist is saying, you know, I saw, I compared, I saw how well they were doing, and I was envious of their prosperity. Uh, so this happened to him. Then Philippians 3, 5, let nothing be done through selfish ambition. Sorry, Philippians 2, verses 3 and 5, 3 to 5. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. And then that chapter, we know, it goes on to talk about how the Lord being uh you know uh god and uh, how he uh, stripped himself of everything of all that and came down right and uh, it says let this mind be in you that was in christ jesus um so so we see all this that in, in this particular verse in philippians 2 we see that you know in verse 4 let each of you look out okay not only for his own interest, which means that, you know, if you look out for your interests, you know, you need to do certain things. Your needs need to be met. Uh, you have certain needs to fulfill, maybe some responsibilities. Well, it's fine. Okay, it's fine. Scripturally, it says, you, know, you if you're looking out for that, you know, I need to 
pay this. I need to take care of this. I need to, it's fine. But, you know, it says, look out not only for this, but also. Okay, not only, but also. You do that, but also for the interests of others. You also be mindful of uh, others' needs. Okay, so others' interests. So that's the thing. You know, you look out. There's nothing wrong in looking out for your own. You need to do that for yourself, for others who are you know part of your life, and but also for the interests of others. Okay, so that's uh, um, so. If I don't do that, then that's you know a wrong uh, attitude which comes out of competition, which comes out of envy, and which comes out of selfish ambition and pride. Right? Okay. Um, what's another one? You no, know, this is this is interesting. You know, false spirituality. Okay, when you say false spirituality, um, it could go either way. Okay, it could it could be with regard to not having anything. Okay. Uh, oh, I'm very spiritual. Uh, sometimes we say, you know, it's a very you know very holy person, very spiritual person. Uh, why? Because that person, you know, does not have any material things at all, you know, has totally let go of it, He's literally living uh, in poverty. Okay. Now we could have, we could equate that to spirituality, or we could even make the mistake of saying, "Hey, that person, you know, he has all this. She has all this. Therefore, God must be very happy. You know, God is blessing. Is living in so much of blessing and abundance, and therefore." You know, that person is very spiritual or thriving spiritually. You know, like two ends of the spectrum, like poverty, abundance. Now, we if we equate that to spirituality, then it's a false spirituality. Okay. Now, let's look at what the Bible has to say. James chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. Um, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith? and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him. Okay, so this is God's heart. So we cannot be partial because a man or a person is wealthy. Okay, nor can we equate that to doing well spiritually or being, uh, you know, doing the, uh, we, we cannot equate that to spiritually thriving and spirituality okay then now that would be a false spirituality right then the other thing that we see is that um uh in first timothy chapter 6 uh, verses 3 to 6 if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words even the words of our lord jesus christ and to the doctrine which accords with godliness he is proud knowing nothing but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, uh, useless wranglings of men, of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, that who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. Okay, so this goes about, uh, you know, describing, uh, they are not uh, consenting to wholesome words, the words of the Lord Jesus, the doctrine which uh, which is in line with godliness, etc. Somebody who's proud, who's envious, who uh, there's strife and all that which is there, um, who supposes, who thinks that godliness is a means of gain. Okay, so okay, why are we doing this? Why are you in ministry? Why are you serving God? Oh, I want to become rich, right? So uh, Paul has some very strong words. He says, from such withdraw yourself. Now godliness with contentment is great gain, okay? So to equate prosperity, wealth, 
uh, with spirituality or to say that okay that person is thriving doing well spiritually now that's uh, that's false that's a false um, judgment uh, it does it is not right okay at the same time to go back to that other extreme and say that person does not have anything and is extremely poor and therefore must be a very spiritual person that is also wrong that is also wrong right so um, both are wrong okay so godliness with contentment is great gain um, we looked at the other i just want to remind us again it is god who gives us the power to get wealth he takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants um, and we're going to look at several other scriptures where it is it is god who in it who instituted that the wealth be used for you know to to help others to help the cause of the kingdom and so on so um, we need to keep that in mind we need to uh, you know keep that in perspective right okay then uh we, we might sometimes think that okay money makes us secure you know several verses here i'm just going to look at uh, uh, a couple of those okay the first one is first timothy 6 and verse 17 uh, where paul says command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty which means not to be proud nor to trust in uncertain riches but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. You know, there's a lot in this verse, right? Which gives us uh, the correct attitude or the perspective that we should have about wealth. Okay, he says, command those who are rich. Okay, here are people who are having everything. Okay, who are maybe wealthy with regard to you know, money in the bank, maybe living a comfortable life. They have, you know, with regard to material things, there is no lack. So he's saying, command those who are rich in, the, in this present age not to be haughty, not to be proud, not to become proud because of their wealth. Okay, not to be proud. And the second thing is, let them not put their trust in these riches because these riches can one day be there and another day be wiped out. Uh, business, business can turn bad, economy can turn bad, and I think people realize that, you know, in the pandemic and to, like many businesses, many things that we knew personally, people had to kind of change, do something else, right, and not really continue in that kind of a business. So, um, so, so Paul's writing and says, no, let them not trust, put their trust you know, their hope, their trust, and build their life on that, you know, because these riches can be uncertain. But in the living God, which means let them let them not be proud, let them not put their trust in these riches, but let them put their trust in the living God. Okay, what he says next is very interesting. He says, who gives us richly all things to enjoy okay let me say that again right this living god who gives us richly all things to enjoy so that's god who's a giver who's a generous giver who gives us richly all things to enjoy but with these riches, whatever he gives, don't make that an idol. Don't put your trust in that. Right? Don't become proud because of that. So he's Paul is saying, command, you know, which means not just suggest. You, you command, tell them, tell them strongly as a commandment. They have to obey. Saying, command those who are uh, rich in this present age not to be haughty, not to be proud not to trust in uncertain riches so you know you 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 look at that it's a very fine line it is god who richly 
gives all things to enjoy. But the very things that he gives us, if we are not careful, we can become proud, we can become attached to it so much that we put our trust in it rather than in the living God, who is the source, who is the supply of all these riches. Right. So that's that's uh, that's a very powerful verse. Okay. So um, yeah. So one more verse, and then we'll stop. I'm sorry we didn't have time to go through questions, but uh, maybe next class we can do that. Right. Uh, Matthew six nineteen to twenty one. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust uh, rust destroy, but where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Uh, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Okay. So in all these verses, now you know we need to hold it uh, in a, in a wholesome manner. Like, what is God's heart with regard to money? What is God's heart with regard to riches? What what is God's heart when it comes to me handling? riches is it about me handling riches or is it about riches handling me okay so uh, when we understand that you know it's, it's always a fine line but the lord will help us give that right perspective so that we are liberated and free when it comes to money so that you know no matter how much we handle we are not held by it right and we are not holding on to it tightly so i'm just going to stop here and uh and continue later okay so uh, i'm sure we might have questions uh with regard to money with regard to you know the use of it maybe in church maybe in you know personal life and uh, you know we will answer that as we go on right okay okay so uh, god bless uh, we'll meet again next week bye bye Thank you, Pastor.